Okay. Hello and welcome to the October 2017 installment of the Deep Carbon Observatory's webinar Wednesdays. This series of webinars is brought to you jointly by Synthesis Group 2019 and the engagement team. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of the engagement team. My colleagues and I collaborate with Synthesis Group 2019 to bring DCO's scientific results together and help share these findings and discoveries with the scientific community, the media, and the public. It's my pleasure today to introduce you to Kirsten Lennart. Kirsten is the Doherty Senior Research Scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University and is also Director of the NSF-funded Data Facility Interdisciplinary Earth Data Alliance. Over the past 15 years, Kirsten's work has mostly centered on the development of community-driven data infrastructures for the solid earth sciences and, in particular, on using cyber infrastructure to improve access and sharing of earth and space science data and physical samples. She also works to advance data access and a data sharing for all data communities. Today, Kirsten will guide us in the first step of what is envisioned as a global online catalogue of all physical samples collected in the Earth sciences, and show us how easy it is to register samples in an open, findable, and standard way. Before we start, a few housekeeping bits. If you have questions, please post them in the chat room. Kirsten will answer them at the end of the webinar in a Q&A period. We also invite you to turn on your webcam if you'd like, if you would want to be a visible part of this virtual seminar. However, please keep your microphones muted to avoid feedback issues during the webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to Kirsten. Okay, I'm sharing this presentation here with Megan Carter, who is a data curator here in our AIDA group and um, primarily responsible for um, aspects of the system for a sample registration that we're going to talk about today. So the topics I want to touch on is, you know, first of all, asking you uh, why should you register your samples and give you some answers to that. And I'm glad that uh, Katie already mentioned the sharing of results from the Deep Carbon Observatory because that's what it's actually all about. And then I will talk a little bit about the International Geosample Number and the System for Earth Sample Registration, which is one of the data systems that we're running here at, the, at AIDA. And then uh, in the main part of the presentation, show you how to register your samples. And uh, finally, just point you to resources uh, that you can use uh, if you forget or uh, need more information on how to register your samples. Uh, starting off is a reminder actually on the value of samples. Um, we know uh, that we collect a lot of samples as part of research projects in the earth sciences and environmental sciences as well. And these samples are used to make observations, to generate observational data and measurements uh, especially if you want to study aspects of the Earth that are inaccessible in time and space, uh, and especially in, in time going back uh, to former times studying paleo, paleo climate or the origins of the uh, Earth crust uh, and things that are inaccessible in space, deep in the Earth and so on. Uh, and clearly, samples provide us with evidence of long-term historical trends. They record the state of nature at a given time and place. Uh, they record unique events in history. Uh, I'd like to point at the KT boundary that we wouldn't know about unless we had samples that we could collect. Uh, samples are also essential to calibrate proxy data, remote sensing data, and so on needs the actual physical observation. Uh, or observations on the physical objects from the Earth, and sometimes samples serve as standards and references. Uh, just an example here from the Deep Carbon Observatory, how many of the field studies uh, that are undertaken and supported by the Deep Carbon Observatory are actually going to collect samples. And one of the big projects currently is the Oman drilling. And as you can see here on the right, uh, the estimated costs of uh, doing this drilling are about $4 million. So samples are precious 
uh, and need to be accessible and preserved. Um, and researchers really want to share samples. They want access to samples. And we held a survey in 2015 as part of the iSamples Research Coordination Network. And as you can see here with these flower diagrams, which basically I'm not going to go into uh, explaining in detail, uh, what these show, but the, the more green uh, a flower diagram is, the more positive the answer is, and the more orange and red uh, you have in the flower, the less positive or more negative it is. And so you see here, uh, providing access to actual physical samples is important. Most investigators on a scale of zero to one agree with it at uh, 0.85. Uh, while the process actually of accessing physical samples is clearly not easy for, for researchers. And this also became clear in uh, many of the workshops that the EarthQ program held uh, over several years between 2013 and 15. And you see statements from uh, different executive summaries uh, of these workshops in paleoscience and petrology, geochemistry or mineral physics that all point to the need for uh, access to global collections, for uh, better management of samples, for tracking samples, for linking the data and the analyses in the literature and in data databases to these samples. Uh, there have been other workshops focused, for example, on reproducibility in the sciences that have also pointed to the need to liberate field science samples and data uh, as a fundamental requirement for transparency and reproducibility in research. So what's the status, you know, and uh, just a few questions to you when you think about how you want to use uh, samples, how you want to access data and samples. So have you ever been able to find all data for a specific sample in the literature? That's obviously really difficult because samples don't have unique names. And so if you type something into Science Direct that just says A1, you will not uh, find all the data that was generated on the sample with the name A1. Uh, have you been able to figure out if samples in different publications that have the same name or number are actually from the same specimen? This is a big issue, uh, and we've noticed that in putting together databases that many sample names occur many, many times uh, and are very different, identify very different specimens. So we uh, have, ver it's very difficult to find out if a specific specimen of name M12 is the same as M12 in a different publication. And then it comes down to your uh, individual sample management. And I have many examples uh, of researchers talking to me about their experiences. Uh, trying to identify samples even in your own lab or your uh, sample storage in your desk. Uh, when you look at a sample label that uh, just has uh, a name like A1 and doesn't have further information, can you really uh, still figure out where and when you collected this sample, what it actually is? So I have a few examples here that show, um, you know, how this has impacted reuse and reproducibility of data. Uh, this is an example from Jim Gill and uh, his student Todd, uh, who communicated to us about samples that they were trying to track. Uh, as he states here, a key measurement was on uh, Beckard Basalt uh, by the name of PPTUW. And they were trying to subsequently uh, reproduce the result, but the same sample uh, obviously was renamed in different publications, so it was difficult to actually make the connections. And then uh, some of the important metadata, such as the geospatial location, was missing. So the data were not reproducible and the sample could not be located. Another example here, is uh, actually a letter that came to my husband, uh, Steve Goldstein, uh, from an 
a researcher who wanted access to a sample that was mentioned in a fairly old publication from 1984. And uh, this researcher was looking for further information, uh, what was meant by bike sample, uh, where was the sample exactly from, uh, where was it collected. Uh, and his answer was, I don't know if it was suspended material, bad load, uh, and about the location, I can only point you to the figure in the paper, which is a very small scale map uh, that uh, doesn't really tell uh, the interested researcher where the sample was from. Uh, in the paper, it actually says that details about the sample may be obtained from the author, but as, as he said, it this point, I don't know where the notes are for these samples. Uh, and he specifically points to the importance of the International Geo Sample Number as a way to make uh, this information accessible and persistent. So what are the primary problems? This is a summary here of what I've talked about. There is no central or federated catalog that has information of the sample metadata, so you can find samples where the, uh, the information, the sample metadata are preserved and persistently accessible. There are no common best practices really for identifying samples, documenting them, describing them, and then registering them in catalogs. And there is a lack of software tools that actually support personal or institutional sample man management and curation. There is obviously also a lack of facilities to share samples, but as I'm talking here primarily about the digital side of samples, I'm not going to get into that topic, which is a big one, though. So what I want to talk about are three efforts that are trying to address these problems. This is the International Geo Sample Number, or IGSN, and the System for a Sample Registration, or uh, CESAR, or CESAR, uh, how it's um, usually referred to. And then there are some resources that have recently emerged through uh, the research coordination network iSamples, which is an EarthCube effort. So the IGSN, that is a globally unique and persistent identifier for physical samples and also something that we refer to as sampling features, which are um, more or less virtual samples uh, in the earth. So for example, a borehole that doesn't even doesn't really have a physical object, but is still um, a location on earth that can also be identified with the IGSN. So behind the IGSN is an international uh, effort that guarantees that the numbers are unique via a centralized mechanism. And these IGSNs, similar to DOIs, resolve to virtual sample representations or metadata profiles. And those are managed at uh, so-called allocating agents. Those are organizations that provide services for the registrations of the IGSN and the preservation of IGSN metadata. And the IGSN itself is not a number or a sample name that replaces any institutional or personal uh, naming protocol. It can be compared to the social security number, as I'm showing here, you know, in people I have a name, but I also have a social security number that really uh, ensures uniqueness in, in data systems, be they in the government for uh, tax purposes or for any other tracking of uh, me as a person. The same way a sample can have a name or even multiple names as it moves between sample owners, but it should have only one IGSN that stays unique. So the IGSN is now an international nonprofit organization that was established in 2011 and is registered in Germany. And the members of this organization are the organizations that provide registration services, the so-called allocating agents. You, as a user of the IGSN, do not need to become a member of the organization. Currently, worldwide, we have five active allocating agents. As you see, there is AIDA, 
as the biggest uh, holder of IGSNs because it is the oldest. It started in 2014. Uh, and then we have two organizations in Australia, Geoscience Australia and CSIRO, and two organizations in Germany, MARUM and the Geoforschungszentrum. Um, AIDA serves a number of US, large US repositories and museums, including the Smithsonian and many of the NSF funded repositories, as well as the USGS. But the USGS is actually just becoming uh, an allocating agent and will uh, establish its own registration services, similar to the British Geological Survey and um, the organization in Korea that manages um, geoscience uh, research. Um, very, a very brief look at how the IGSN actually works. Uh, there are the users who submit metadata and register their samples at the allocating agent and the allocating agent interacts with the global central registry to ensure that all the numbers are known and uh, that they are unique. And then other uh, places can actually access the metadata of the allocating agents to build search engines or community portals to access uh, samples of, of, of particular interest. What we're going to be looking at today here is just the interaction between the IGSN user and the allocating agent CSAR. Uh, just a brief overview of the IGSN metadata. Uh, the IGSN comes with a so-called birth certificate. That's all the information that is known about a sample when it is created, when it is collected. It's the sample name, uh, what type of sample it is, what material is it, is it a rock, is it a sediment, and is it ice, uh, where it was collected, when it was collected, how it was collected, and then a uh, part of this birth certificate, and that's actually a bit of an exception because it's information that is generated over time, are related identifiers of subsamples being taken from, uh, from a sample. And the allocating agents then can establish addition or can, can add uh, further metadata depending on the community that they're serving, the types of samples they're managing, and so on. So, for example, CSAR also has an age, a geological unit, information about the archive, and so on. So, with that, we're coming to a brief overview of uh, CSAR, the System for Earth Sample Registration. Uh, CSAR provides a web-based database that catalogs and preserves metadata of samples that are submitted by users, and that includes researchers, it includes repositories and museums, and in part it's also laboratories such as geochronology labs and so on that register their samples on an ongoing basis. Uh, with us to use to make sure that the specimens they're using in their labs are uniquely identifiable. Uh, CSAR is the allocating agent uh, in, of AIDA in the IGSN EV. Uh, and what is important here for this presentation is that CSAR provides these tools for users to submit and manage sample metadata. Uh, those are authenticated workspaces that allow um, users to really manage their samples and all the information about it. And then as uh, additionally, CESA also provides um, an interface for searching the metadata catalog. And we're not going to be looking at that today. So how to register your samples with that? I'm actually handing over to Megan, who is the expert here of uh, knowing everything about sample registration. She will, whatever you send to us, she will actually do the quality control of the metadata and help you through the process. Megan. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, as Kirsten just mentioned, um, I am your main point of contact if you have questions about registering samples in CSAR. And we have some slides here to show you kind of the nuts and bolts of how to register samples and manage samples in CSAR. 
Um, the thing I want to get across is that it's actually not a very difficult process, but we want to help you as much as possible, and I want to help you as much as possible, so please don't hesitate to contact me at any point. So as you can see on this slide, there are three different mechanisms for registering samples in CSAR. We have web services for doing so. That's how some of our larger uh, users have access to CSAR, so the Smithsonian used that mechanism. We also have on the right, you can see a web form for registering samples individually, uh, one by one, so you fill out one form for every sample. The most popular registration mechanism is actually the batch registration mechanism. And this is simply an Excel spreadsheet that you download. You can customize and put in the fields that you want, and then you fill it out and upload it. Um, it's, it's really very similar to how you would work with any other Excel spreadsheet. So that's what I'll be talking about. In order to get started, you go to www.geosamples.org, which is what you're seeing here, and you click New User. Um, and when you do that, you have to create what's called, currently what's called a GeoPass account. And this is an authentication mechanism that allows you access to CSAR as well as a number of other AIDA systems. So you, you fill out the form once and then you have a username and password to get into CSAR. So what you see here is the My CSAR dashboard. And I like to call this sort of the central command center of for all the things you can do in CSAR. You see that there are a number of tabs across the top with different uh, tasks that you can complete to view your samples, to register new samples, to search the sample catalog, for example. And then there are also these quick links at the top to do a variety of the same things, but just access them more quickly. And then below that, you see the My Samples, which is a list of any samples you have already registered in CSAR. So in order to create and upload a batch registration template, you would select the register update samples tab at the top that I pointed to, and then you would select create a batch file template. And once you go there, there are a variety of different selections that you can make to create what is a customized template. For CSAR, we require very little metadata. So we require actually only that you define a sample name and a sample uh, type. So what is it? Is it a, is it a core? Is it a dredge? Is it a, um, could be many, many different things. But um, obviously, the more metadata, the better. We want to create sample metadata profiles that are searchable and discoverable and really rich so that other people and even you can really figure out what your samples are and not just um, a rock by with a name. So these are examples of metadata fields that can be completed. So in the batch template creator, you can check off the box. And if you check off the box when you download the template, that field will be included. Um, yes, so when you are happy with the fields that you have chosen, oh, I should say this. So the fields that have an asterisk next to them, we tried to highlight those fields that are actually searchable in the CSAR catalog. So this gives you a sense for whether if you fill out that field, it will actually result in greater searchability and discoverability in the catalog. So I like to promote in particular those fields. So once you cl click Submit to create template, you get a zip file, and the zip file has two files inside of it. One of them, the one I'm showing you first, is called the CSAR Quick Guide. And this is really a cheat sheet. Um, it's, a, it's a file that a lot of people like to ignore, but I find it to be very helpful, a way to resource for filling out the template. So here you can see on the left, every single field that you can currently put into a batch template along with an example, a definition, and any additional instructions. And this includes links to controlled or selected vocabularies. In addition to that, we've also highlighted in yellow those fields that are searchable in the CSAR catalog. So again, we're trying to give you some guidance um, about what the, the minimum amount of metadata should be, in our opinion. So this is what the CSAR batch registration template looks like. You can see it's just a very simple template with the column headers that you've selected and you can simply start um, filling it out. So let's just move on to the next one. So once you've filled it out, I should have uh, provided an example with actually having filled some of these things out. But once you've completed your template, you go back to the register update samples tab in my CSAR and click upload a new batch registration template. Once you select your file, you click upload. And then you come to the batch grid 
preview. So this should show you pretty much your file with all of your fields. And if uh, a series of validations are run on your file when you actually click upload. So if there are no problems, you can simply select this register now button at the bottom of the page. If there are problems, that register now button will not show up and you'll see an array of, well, hopefully not an array, hopefully a single error message in red at the top that describes to you what needs to be changed about your file. So here we have an example where there are actually three problems with my file and the problematic cells are highlighted in red, as you can see. So in this case, I tried to give an IGSN to a sample that was already assigned to another sample. So obviously that, that's a, a very big mistake and we can't have multiple samples having the same IGSN. Similarly, I tried to assign a parent IGSN to a sample that simply did not exist. So this was me saying that there's another sample in the system with this IGSN and that's the parent of the sample that I'm registering. But in fact, that parent sample had not been um, registered yet. So that that's not correct either. The parent wasn't yet defined. And then I tried to assign a material of material, which is not a material, <laughs> it's funny. Um, and so this is not part of our control vocabulary for materials. So here you can see in the error message, it provides the controlled list and you can simply um, fix your spreadsheet and upload it again. And then hopefully those error messages won't come again and you'll receive a success message. At this point, um, it's out of your hands. I received the batch template. I take a, a quick look at it to make sure that everything looks to make sense. In addition to the, the validations that are already programmed into the system, there are some additional checks that I do. And then, you know, depending on the day and time, <coughs> I can usually send you your batch back within a few hours. Um, sometimes it takes as much as a day. Thank you. So now that you've registered your samples, you can view them. As Kirsten mentioned, this is not just a place to register or archive your information, but it's actually a place to manage your samples from. So once you've registered your samples, you can go to the My Samples tab in My CSAR and view or edit all of them. So this is the, the list of samples that you may have just registered. And you see the hyperlinks to view or edit. So you can edit any of the fields that you had already entered when you registered the samples. In addition, you can attach images. You can also add um, links to external data and metadata, such as URLs or DOIs of related publications. Now, one thing I want to discuss is um, how you can update sample metadata in bulk. So in this previous slide, I showed you how you can edit um, samples one by one. So maybe there's a problem with one of the samples you registered and you just need to change one thing. That's the fastest way to do so. But perhaps there was an error in the batch that you registered and you need to fix 50 samples or 100 samples. The best way to do that is also using a batch um, template similar to the very similar, almost identical to the one that you just uploaded to register the samples in the first place. Now, here is another example. So on the top, you can see that there's very minimal metadata in the template showed at the top. You just have sample names, one through 20. You have IGSNs that you would like to assign and a material. But other than that, there's no other metadata included in this template. So an example of when you might register a batch like this could be if you're planning a field excursion and you want to go out in the field with some labels that have IGSNs on them and you know you're going to collect rocks, but you know nothing else pretty much about the samples at that time. So you would register this top batch, which is sort of a dummy batch, as we might colloquially call it. And then when you come back from the field with all of that additional information, your sample names, your um, description of the sample, maybe the exact latitude and longitude of collection, you can fill out one of these templates, upload it, and update the metadata in the process. So on the bottom in red, you can see the additional metadata I wanted to add to the sample um, profiles for these samples. Um, other changes, yes, perhaps you want to change the release date for the metadata. Maybe um, somebody has gone through and done a more specific study of what, what the samples actually are, so you have a more descriptive um, terminology for it. Maybe the parent samples were registered at a later time and you want to make sure that the, the parent samples and the child subsamples are properly associated with each other. You can also do that later. So on the left here, you see that very minimal metadata profile. And on the right, you see the result of updating the metadata in, in this case in the batch format. This is the same as how it would look if you'd use the edit 
one by one option as well. So we have a few tips uh, for registering samples. Samples should always be registered by the owner of the samples, so the person who has the physical object, um, hopefully when it's first collected. A metadata management, however, can be collaborative. So if you're a part of a larger um, project, maybe um, the example I like to give, because this is where it's actually been used the most, is within the critical zone observatories. So you have samples that are used by multiple investigators, but all sort of part of the same um, sampling site. Um, they like to share privileges for um, CSAR account, their CSAR accounts with multiple people. One way that this might be useful is if you have a student come work for you for a period of time and you want to give them privileges to register samples within your account or to view or edit um, your samples for you. You can share those privileges for a specified amount of time with them. Let's see, also if you transfer your samples to a different physical location or if you transfer them to a different person, you can transfer the metadata along with them. There's a mechanism to actually move it from you to them and, and then they then own that metadata. So think of the amount of documentation you don't have to do because you've just moved over what you've already put into CSAR. Uh, you should register samples as soon as possible after they are collected. And as we talked about before, there is that possibility to sort of pre-register IGSN so that you have those labels and those IGSNs when you're in the field. Um, that is the ideal situation. You should, of course, register any subsamples or splits that you take and link them to the parent sample so that that sample genealogy can be maintained. You should also ensure that your sample metadata are as complete as possible, as soon as possible. Um, that update mechanism does exist, like I mentioned, and that's great, but what are the odds that you will actually go back and use that? So if you have the information, the incentive is there to do it, do it early. Um, and we also, like I said, want to have a discoverable sample, samples that are reusable, and that requires that as much metadata as possible exist. Okay, so it's Kirsten Beck for the last part where we just wanted to give you uh, some uh, further advice on, you know, how to really use the IGSN. I mean, once you have it, uh, that's really great, but then it its benefits come only uh, out if you are actually using the IGSN. So um, one of the most important uh, purposes of the IGSN is to be able to, to track a sample through its, through its life cycle. So that means that the IGSN should always be on a sample label. That's really important, that the IGSN stays close to the actual sample. Uh, so Megan already talked about using our tool for generating labels, and we are open to helping you uh, create labels of the size or materials uh, that are relevant for you. Uh, we we try to respond to, to the needs of our users there. And again, you can then take labels with pre-registered IGSNs and QR codes uh, with you into the field. Uh, you should clearly make sure that an IGSN is on any sample that you share with colleagues, because if you start generating um, data in parallel and publish data in parallel, the IGSN is the mechanism that ensures that you can link that data later on. Um, and that means also to tell your colleagues that they should use the IGSN, especially also when they cite the sample in publications. So um, that's the, uh, the important aspect to include the IGSN both in data tables, data files that you uh, either send to repositories or attach to publications as supplementary uh, documents, and then clearly when you cite a sample in a publication, be it in the text, be it in a data table, use the IGSN so that the connection between data can be made. Uh, we have an example here of, um, 
of a program that actually has or is creating shared sample collections. It's the Xterra uh, effort within the GeoPrisms program here. And their website clearly states that anything they collect during their field institutes will get IGSNs and be registered in CESA. Uh, so this is really an example for this collaborative uh, managing of samples and even here collaborative collecting of samples and their use uh, across a whole group of investigators to, uh, to study the samples. This is a perfect example for us uh, of the benefits that the IGSN brings. And with respect to publications, uh, we have over the last few years worked quite closely with publishers who are now recommending the use of IGSNs in publications when data are included for samples or when there are observations uh, for samples that are mentioned in the text. This is here um, the statement of commitment of the Coalition for Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Sciences. Uh, it's an effort, a joint effort of publishers and data facilities um, that clearly supports and promotes the use of IGSNs for samples in publications. Uh, here's the example uh, of two publishers, one AGU publications, uh, published actually an article about it saying registering samples and including IGSNs in papers uh, helps secure provenance information but helps to connect common samples across multiple studies in the literature. And just uh, last fall, Copernicus Publications in Europe uh, has also started recommending the IGSN. Uh, and here is an example of a paper that is using the IGSN. You can see on the right side in, inside the red box uh, are the, the column for IGSNs in the data table of that paper. And uh, each one of these IGSNs is actually an active link that when you click on it, you get to the sample profile in CSAR and you can see the full metadata record, including uh, the links to all the, um, the children samples of this particular um, river water sample. Uh, we have also started to implement the IGSN in data systems, like here in the EarthChem library. Uh, there is a way to uh, actually type in an IGSN and then find all the data sets in the EarthChem library uh, that have data for that particular uh, IGSN or for that sample. Uh, this is currently done uh, in, in an automated way that uh, our data templates for the EarthChem library have a column for the IGSN and when uh, a data set is uploaded, uh, there is an automatic script to extract IGSNs from the uh, column in that data table uh, into the metadata of the data set so that it becomes searchable. So with this, uh, we're basically at the end and just wanted to show you uh, that we have a lot of resources uh, that can help you uh, with your registration, uh, doing it right. Uh, so there are YouTube um, videos as tutorials. There are downloadable PDFs, uh, which are you know, presentations, basically PowerPoint files uh, with screenshots that tell you how to use the registration tools. Uh, there is the quick guide and other things uh, that you can can use. There's also, and we wanted to briefly point to that, uh, the iSamples RCN has created further resources. Uh, one is actually a very, um, very exciting effort of some early career scientists in the RCN to build training modules for sample management. Uh, currently, there are two uh, modules, one for soil cores and one for rock outcrop samples, but we're looking for others to generate more. Uh, there is actually a customizable template for such sample management training modules. Uh, and the uh, second is a middleware built by Jim Bowring and his students in South Carolina. 
which is a software prototype that allows users to seamlessly uh, transfer metadata from their preferred sample metadata formats and spreadsheets and so on uh, to uh, the CSAR metadata profiles. And with that, uh, we want to invite you to contact us if you have further questions. Uh, we would also like to invite you to uh, stop by at the AGU Fall meeting. We have an AIDA booth in the exhibit hall. And there is on Sunday before the meeting starts, there is an IGSN information session. The exact date, or exact time and location uh, will be announced on the uh, geosamples.org website. And we invite you to let other uh, colleagues know about this and hopefully get them to use the IGSN as well. So with that, thanks, and we are happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Kisle. Um, so we, we have a little time if there are any questions. I see that Megan already answered a couple of questions in the chat window, so um, we're not going to revisit those. Um, right, well, if, if uh, no one has any questions, then um, I want to thank you all for joining us and thank you, Kirsten and Megan, for such an informative presentation. We'll be posting an archive of this webinar soon on the DCO website, um, deepcarbon.net. If you have any ideas for future Webinar Wednesday series, please feel free to contact me and let me know. And in the meantime, I hope you will join us at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, the 15th of November, for the last Webinar Wednesday in this series, when Louise Kellogg will present a blueprint for creating a box model. So thanks again for joining us, and I hope to see you all in a month's Thank time. Thank you. Thank you.